In the first part of this tutorial, we looked at the definition of the limit of a function at a point, and now in the second part, we're going to look at some examples to show how to prove limits of functions. Suppose we have a function f of x equals x plus 1 over 2, and we want to prove that as x approaches 0, the function approaches a value of a half. In other words, the limit is a half. So here's our function, and obviously it's just a straight line, and we know that it's going to cross the vertical axis at a half, but we want to actually prove that using the limit definition. So our value of l is a half, and our value of x0 is 0, because we want to look at the limit as x approaches 0. And here are the two red lines, l minus epsilon and l plus epsilon, if we think of epsilon as being a fixed small number, and you can see that if x is between these two green lines, then the function is inside the red zone. But we want to work out exactly how close x needs to be to 0 in order for the function to be inside the red zone. And a useful technique with these kinds of questions is to start with the inequality modulus of f of x minus l smaller than epsilon and work backwards, because then we can work out what condition we need on the value of x, and then we can decide what delta should be. So if we write down this inequality, modulus of f of x minus l smaller than epsilon, in our example, this is equivalent to saying the modulus of x plus 1 over 2 minus a half is smaller than epsilon. So here's our function f of x, and here's the limit l which we're trying to prove. And if you simplify that, that's just saying that the modulus of x over 2 is smaller than epsilon. And that tells us the modulus of x needs to be smaller than 2 epsilon. So remember, this inequality is what we need rather than what we've got. And because we have these signs here, meaning that the steps we've written down are equivalent, that means that not only can we go from the first step to the last step, we can also go from the last step back to the first step. So we know that if the modulus of x minus 0 is smaller than 2 epsilon, that actually ensures that the modulus of x plus 1 over 2 minus a half is smaller than epsilon, which is what we want. So if we define delta to be equal to 2 epsilon, because remember delta can be chosen in terms of epsilon, that will actually give us the result we need. So let's go back to the diagram to see that. If we imagine an interval around 0 on the x-axis, going from 0 minus delta to 0 plus delta, we need to work out how small to make delta so that the interval fits in between the two green lines. And the way we've drawn the interval on this diagram, you can see that this is actually the largest possible interval we can have. If it was any larger, it wouldn't fit between the green lines. So on our diagram, obviously delta is this width here, it's half the width of the interval, and also epsilon is this height here, going from L to L plus epsilon. And because this diagram has been drawn roughly to scale, so the gradient of the blue line should be roughly correct, it should be about a half, you can see that delta is roughly twice the size of epsilon on the diagram. So this confirms what we calculated a moment ago. So our conclusion is that if we choose delta equals 2 epsilon, then we know that f of x will be within a distance of epsilon from L whenever x is within a distance of delta from 0. And bear in mind, if we know one value of delta works, then we also know that any smaller value of delta will also work, because obviously if we make our interval smaller, it will still fit between the green lines. So there are actually infinitely many values of delta you can have, it's just a matter of finding a value of delta which is small enough. And in this example, delta equals 2 epsilon is actually the largest possible value of delta which will work. Now let's look at one more example, just to show something slightly different. This time our function is x squared plus 3x, and we want to prove that it approaches a limit of 0 as x tends to 0. So this is what our function looks like, and we're looking at what happens at the origin. But in this example we're just going to go straight to the calculation steps, rather than putting all those red lines and green lines etc. on the diagram. So this is the limit we're trying to prove, and using the limit definition again, we need to show that given any positive value of epsilon, the modulus of x squared plus 3x minus 0 is smaller than epsilon when x is sufficiently close to 0.
or in other words when x is within the distance of delta from zero, and we're trying to find a value of delta which causes that to happen. Now our strategy in this example is going to be a bit different. This is a strategy you can sometimes use when your function has two terms added together and you think you should be able to prove the limits of the individual terms separately. So in this example we're going to say that we should be able to prove that x squared tends to zero as x tends to zero and we should be able to prove that 3x tends to zero as x tends to zero. And if we want to prove that they tend to zero, usually using the method we've seen up to this point, we would try to make them both smaller than epsilon, where epsilon is an arbitrary small number. But because we now have two terms added together, we're going to do a slight manipulation. Instead of making them both smaller than epsilon, we're going to make them both smaller than epsilon over two, because we want to be able to say that when we add them both together, we're going to get something smaller than epsilon. And what you have to bear in mind is that if you can prove that you can always make these terms smaller than epsilon, no matter how small epsilon is, then that means you can also make them smaller than epsilon over 2, or epsilon over 10, or epsilon over 100, or epsilon over anything, because these quantities are all just arbitrary small numbers. And the point of the limit definition is that no matter how small this quantity epsilon becomes, you can still make f of x within that distance of the limit l. So if we can show that these two inequalities hold, then we'll be able to use the triangle inequality to say that the modulus of x squared plus 3x is less than or equal to the modulus of x squared plus the modulus of 3x, which is then smaller than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2, which is epsilon. So the only problem with this is now we need to choose delta in such a way that both of these two inequalities are satisfied when x is within a distance delta of 0. So remember, in the last example, we started with the f of x minus l inequality and worked backwards. And we're going to do the same thing here, except we have to do it twice. So if we start with modulus of x squared smaller than epsilon over 2, simplifying that, we get that the modulus of x needs to be smaller than the square root of epsilon over 2. And then if we look at the next inequality, modulus of 3x smaller than epsilon over 2, that just gives us modulus of x smaller than epsilon over 6. So these are the two conditions on x that we need. We need the modulus of x to be smaller than the square root of epsilon over 2 and smaller than epsilon over 6. And if we want the modulus of x to be smaller than both of these two things, another way of writing that is to just say we want it to be smaller than the minimum of the two things. So if we define delta to be the minimum of these two things, whichever one is smaller, then we know that if the modulus of x minus 0 is smaller than delta, then that means it has to be smaller than the square root of epsilon over 2 and smaller than epsilon over 6. And then based on our calculations from a moment ago, we know that these two inequalities will be satisfied. And that means using the triangle inequality, the modulus of x squared plus 3x ends up being smaller than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2, which is epsilon. So that completes the proof. So let's just summarise what we've talked about in this tutorial. When you're trying to prove the limit of a function at a point, the challenge is to show that it's possible to choose delta in terms of epsilon in such a way that it satisfies the definition. So you think of epsilon as something that you've been given, and you have to find a corresponding value of delta which works for that particular value of epsilon. Or in other words, you have to find a formula for choosing delta in terms of epsilon. Not every example is as easy as the ones we've covered in this tutorial, but in many examples, especially if you're looking at the limit as x approaches zero, a good strategy is to start with the inequality modulus of f of x minus l smaller than epsilon and work backwards to find out what that's saying about x, and that should tell you how you need to define delta. And remember, if one value of delta works, then any smaller value of delta will also work, but in practice, if you're trying to prove a limit, then finding one value of delta which works is good enough. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed that.
The next video will be on continuous and differentiable functions, so look out for that one coming soon.